Welcome to the Dog Psychology Podcast with Todd and Art. All right, welcome to the Dog Psychology Podcast with Todd and Art. What's up, Todd? How are you? What's going on, brother? How are you? Pretty good. Let me turn my notifications off real quick because I hate to be bothered. There we go. All right, so I wanted to talk to us about something today and how we assess dogs. And uh, we're going to watch a video that I came across social media today. Um, I think we'll just, those of you that are listening on Spotify, you can still access the video uh, here on Spotify. But if you're on Apple Podcasts, you might need to go to YouTube. So make sure to find and follow while you're there. Subscribe to the Dog Psychology Podcast on YouTube and Spotify or wherever. But in order to see the video, you can either watch it on Spotify or on YouTube. So we're about to share a video um, of a dog, uh, someone doing an assessment on a dog. Okay. You ready, Todd? All right, uh, window, here we go. There it is. All right, and just kind of his context says Myrtle came in as a stray. She was lean, but had lots of muscle. Her canines were in rough shape, and she had some scars around her face. She barked constantly in her kennel. This was her dog test. Myrtle was, euthan was, euth Myrtle was euthanized. Do you think they're trying to uh, say she was fighting? She was a fighting dog? Is that what they're trying to... I think so. I think they're trying to justify, you know, because uh, the, the, the teeth could be... You a know, like talking to wear down a teeth if you're obsessive. Yeah, you know. but if they're like, say they were in a kennel, chewing yep. down on the on the wiring, can, yep. can wear those canines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could be a, a variety of reasons. Let's say it was housed in a kennel for whatever reason, and dogs were walking by, and it has the intensity to to you know get overly excited and read, starts using its mouth in a way. Right. There's a lot of things that can be happening, but let's go and watch that video. Yep. Play it. And it's not two minutes long, too, by the way. So, or a minute forty five seconds. So for those who, who are listening but can't see it, they're using a stuffed dog, and they're and they're vi they're like bouncing it around. It's almost like they're they're trying to entice a cat with a ball of yarn, and they're and they, I guess, are assessing. I say this in quotes the way the other dog feels about dogs, and we'll go back and play it again. But the dog jumps on the the back of the dog, and I can't hear, but it, it sounds like it's it's it's, it's going into biting on the dogs on the back of the neck. So it's telling me that I can't share the audios. I have to share a tab instead. So that almost like, um, I mean, I could pull it up from Facebook, Todd, but the thing is, if I do that, it's going to, what I don't want to do is shame the person who shared this, right? Well, My, let's just play it without sound. Okay. Uh, you know, is it, at least you can see it. You don't even need to see very much of it to, to you know, give opinion or, or insight or question, really. Okay. She's not biting it. Well, there she no. is. No? She's, she's not. She's punching it, like she's touching it, but she's not biting it. When you hit, when you can hear it, Art, is it really vocal? So that was the first part. Here's like a second part of the video. Here, uh, like she's still not had her, like she's almost like pinning the dog down. Yeah. Well, it's it's not, there's no energy in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like this is. It... Yeah, you know, she's trying to get to Taz, by the way. It just got a little more real right there when they tried to move it. Yeah. She can't. Uh -huh. It's almost like a, it's, it's like it's a, a when a dog plays a. Now there's something. There, there it goes right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, the part that is disappointing is they enticed this as much as anything. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying the dog doesn't have you. The dog's obviously got some yeah. things that it would, it would be reactive. It would be my guess. Um, but why do th it this way? There's a lot of other ways that could do this. She's probably happy. So you couldn't hear in the audio, but at the very end, they're like joking, by the way. They, I really want to play this with sound, but they say something like, is she really happy or is she trying to murder murder it? Like, And they're joking about it. <laughs> you know uh, what I mean? Um, and, and that so, dog was put down for sure? Yeah, the dog was put down. 
Right. Yeah. And so what do you think? What do you think? Well, I don't, here's the thing. Like, here's my opinion on the whole thing. Like, I, I think using a stuffed animal to make an assessment on if a dog is going to be aggressive towards other dogs is not a good way. And I'll tell you why. And it goes back to, you know, we're at the ranch at DPC and Caesar has the tortoises. And I've mentioned this in the, in the past. Yeah. And a tortoise, a shell, looks like a rock. It's, it's this solid thing that's just in the ground. And usually the tortoises are in their shell and we bring the dogs to them and it freaks the dogs out. In my opinion, what I believe is that the dog goes up to a shell, to a rock that has energy behind it. Right. And so it really throws the dogs off because why does this rock have so much uh, like a living energy behind it? Right. Dogs are not dumb. They know if it's like a stuffed animal or if it's a living being. And the fact that they can see that uh, when they're making the assessment that the dog can do these things, I'm not saying that it won't do those things. I'm just saying it's a bad way of testing it. And so, but for what I take from it, like if I can see how the dog interacts, and for me, it's always about how can I what do I have available to, what is the sensitivity of, of this dog in a way to make it move away? For, so when it does get into that mindset of, I want to move forward, how do we get it to not move towards it? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, use that tool more as a, as a way to, to see if you can test the ability to stop it. Right. Then, then to create it. They were antagonizing that. I mean, you know, who, who continues to allow a dog and then you, I mean, that, that, they're bouncing that thing the whole time. Right. And they pull it away. And when they really start to pull it away is when you see it, the, yeah. the escalation of that. It's of like a flirt pole. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, tug. I was thinking like a tug game is or even it. a tug, the same thing. Yeah. And if you think about it, like my dog Buddha, who is not the smartest dog in the world, but he is the most loyal dog. He loves like goes to town on those like, you know, tug toys. Like you would probably think he was aggressive by the way he tugs on, but he is the nicest with dogs. You well, know? It's something that you understand as well. It's not that you you get them all frothy on a tug game and leave them frothy. You know, so it's it's there's always context to everything. I get asked these questions all the time. You know, should you let a dog fill in the blank? I'm like, well, you know, it, it depends. Everything's about you know the psychology of being able to create acceptance versus where you're at. And right. if you get a dog worked up and you can't regulate that, then that's then no, you shouldn't do it. Even even if you can do it, you shouldn't do it. So I've always gone with, I allow what I can control, you know, and I and I won't allow what I can't control. So mm -hmm. if, if I can let my dog chase a squirrel, but I can also you know yep. stop it, right? So yeah, that dog I can let chase a squirrel. But if some dogs can't run ten feet at something without it just opening up Pandora's box, and then they're just gone. So you know, you it's knowing your dog and knowing you know, what you can expect in different scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand using them for other type of assessments, although I get how you can, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about some other ones that have used it. I would never use a dog to assess, or excuse me, a stuffed animal to assess a dog's temperament on if they're aggressive or not aggressive. You will, in my opinion, figure out quickly if the dog is sensitive or not. Right. You know, because of what I have found is that the sensitive dogs are, are definitely um, going to respond. I just watched some video of a, a sticker of a cat and, and the, you know, the resident cat walks out and the owners have a sticker of a cat on the wall. And, you know, there's a 90 second standoff. Or, yeah. You know, because it's it stays visual. Mm -hmm. And um, I use all kinds of ways to assess. Like I have a. I have a fence, a chain link fence. And I go, well, what about barrier aggression? I get it. But this is one of the things I've done is I'll bring my pack on one side. I'll have somebody walk to the other side. And I say, as soon as you come around the corner and your dog sees my dogs, I don't want you to hold the leash. We're not doing any of that. I want to see which direction your dog goes. You know, yeah. because a lot of dogs that have been amped up and want to run towards and charge and do all this stuff. As soon as you drop the leash, do they stand there? And, or they even go backwards a couple of steps. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to create assessments um, I think, and this is something that we want to talk about in today's episode is there's a lot of old school protocols about how to assess or introduce and how to deal with these things that from my opinion are kind of based on the assumption you don't have any control, like that everything's a guessing game, Yeah. right? We're at the mercy of the dog. And 
I think that's what people need is the ability to be able to look at a situation and go, how do these two dogs get along? How does that dog feel about that stuffed animal? Are we creating this? How much energy did we put into this stuffed animal to make this dog do this? How much is coming from the dog? You know, is this going to be something he does in all social situations? Is it geared towards dogs or animals? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We've talked about that before. Like there's, it's because a dog wants to be aggressive over here. Doesn't mean, you know, the humans over here are in danger. Yeah. There was a a video that uh, one of our colleagues posted, uh, Ian Grant, and he mentioned you. He's like, oh, Todd had mentioned this. And I was honestly... To be honest with you, I love Ian, but I, I was really confused by the video. And I know it got a lot of traction, got a lot of views. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, like, uh, from, I, I think from what he was saying is that he was able to see maybe the insecurity of, of the dog. I don't know. Like, w- what I, did I, you I, tell him or what was it? So I think this is what he took from it. So what I was explaining is I have used, a, I have a big stuffed lion and I have used it to imprint corrections on visually reactive dogs, right? So you, what we mean by this is a dog that, you know, a lot of dogs are, when they see another dog, they get reactive and that's, it's visual. It's because they're staying in their eyes. It's an excited, reactive part of the brain. And so if I'm working with a dog like that, I want an opportunity to set up a correction If I'm going to use that, if that is going to be the strategy that I use, but I want to set it up with the most premeditated uh, timing that I can get, Mm -hmm. you know, I I, honestly, I think this is one of the things from Caesar that we've all probably learned that we wouldn't have necessarily had the detail of had we not is the importance of timing that first correction, if it's going to be needed. And so what I would do is I would, I would have this really big stuffed lion sit right here inside my front doors and the blinds would be closed and I'd walk the dog in and right when I'd walk in, it would be met with this face, this eye contact and it would see it. And and if a dog saw it and puffed up and went like that, then I could, I could apply a touch right there because the timing was to where the dog was still low intensity, but the brain was in a preparation state. So my belief is that catching the intention is the easiest way to stop the behavior. Most people are reactive. They get it after the behavior has been practiced. And mm-hmm. even if you're good at stopping it, it still happened. And so then what I would do is I would take the dog from that situation. I would follow through, settle the dog, and then I would immediately take them outside. And I had like an imprint. I had a, a connection with the dog right, with the ability to settle them down. And then I could mm-hmm. take them right out to the dogs outside. And it was something that I did. And that was what I used it for. I had not used it for, hey, I'm going to set this stuffed animal up and let's see how the other animals respond to it. Um, it was yeah. done in that capacity. Now, yeah. there are times where what would happen is I would bring a dog in and the dog would, would it would move back. And so then you're like, okay, this is all, you know, you know, the uh, human, blah, 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 is coming more into it. Um, but no, that that was, that was. Yeah, like, when he mentioned your name, I was really confused because, because I, me personally, I was like, I don't see Todd doing that right like no, it was just kind of like stay at one of the circles or you would have seen me do it you know i mean we've watched each other work enough there's really i don't think too many secrets that one of us has that the other one wouldn't know about it. yeah so. yeah it, it was one of those things that made me go hmm would todd really do that yeah. <laughs> but you know the, the when i was talking about the turtle earlier there's another like i remember when i used to live in downtown there used to be this um statuary like those places that sell statues and yeah, yeah. i used to walk the dogs over there and i remember the one time i was i was had this dog um, and there was a statue of a dog, right? So the opposite end of, of the opposite end of, or the other side of, of the tortoise that has energy, this statue looked like a dog from a distance. It stood mm. like a dog, but it didn't have the energy behind it. And they're like, wait a minute, what, what the heck's going on? They start like, they're yeah. unsure, they get insecure, things like that. Now, that could be the same thing that we just saw with this video. The dog becomes unsure, unsecure, and it wants to make it go away, but they're in they're almost antagonizing the dog. They are, you know, moving it around. So the dog's like, uh, uh, like it's, it's, yeah. it, and it, it's and moving it, forward. It didn't jump. It did. It moved forward. You could see it was kind of mouthy, but it didn't go right into, I'm going in and getting that thing. Yeah. It was like and pinning it, it down. It, it, it went in and it, and it took a minute to get it to that point where it looked like towards the end when it was getting quite intense. You know, one of the things that they, uh, that the positive community will, will, will say is what they, that we think that we do is that we flood the dog. That is exactly what they just did, by the way. They flooded that dog 
but because they're called positive, um, they, people don't see it as they just flooded that dog. So the thing that they criticize us is the same thing that they, they actually do. Oh yeah. They, that's given. I, I, I don't even, I don't even try to break down their reasoning unless it's sitting in front of me and there's a reason for it. Um, yeah, I, I'm off. I, again, we know how to do it. It's not flooding. Even the word flooding is, is a bit extreme, but no, I mean, they're getting to the point where they don't want to expose the dog to anything. And that's, that's the solution. Well, that's not, that can't be the solution. You know, you can't just completely start isolating these dogs from all these things that make them nervous or reactive. Right. So there's a comfortable spot where you can communicate. You can't do that. And you can communicate, look, I know you can do that. I, I know that this is a lot for you right now, but I know you can do it. And I know you've seen over and over again, a lot of times when you take a dog through difficult things, you can see the connection grow with it. You can tell that they like, oh yeah, you, you made me feel better. And, and it's almost like a self-esteem. They can't define it, but they know you brought something that enhances them. And, you know, that, that would have been a better choice with that, that little temperament test, if you want to call it that is, Hey, can we get this dog to settle down? How right. about I go and start to walk the dog around? Or even if you want to start practicing, you know, your techniques of purely positive, wherever it is, I don't give a shit, go nuts. Let's see what happens. Like, what can we accomplish right now? That's better than what you think is going to happen. It, it maybe it's, it was a, a, something that they wanted, you know, maybe they were trying to come up with the reason they didn't to not keep the dog. You know, there's a lot of, there could be a lot of backstory to that too. That dog could be making a lot of people uncomfortable and, and some of the people in the shelter are like, Hey, look, we can't keep this dog. We have to prove that we can't keep this dog. Go prove that we can't keep this dog. Yeah. And that's another thing is like, I'm not trying to be the hero and, you know, do all the other things because I'm not that either. I'm not the dog savior. Um, however, I think we do need to advocate in some situations because like, I just had a conversation with somebody today. Uh, who runs a rescue and she was telling me that there's a dog that they have that's in their care that is pretty good in the home, but the, they have a toddler and the toddler starting to walk and it's making the dog very uncomfortable. And she was the, this person that runs the rescue was like, you know, we just don't feel comfortable with the dog going into another home, but also not comfortable safe within this home either. And so the, the foster mom is like, you know, like we need to, uh, you know, figure something out. It's getting, things are getting a little uncomfortable we should probably act pretty quick, you know, first of all. And she's like, you know, I think we might need to take her and, and euthanize her. And so she's like, but I just, you know, I know the foster mom is going to feel really guilty about that. I'm like, I want to share a story with you because this kind of goes on to like everything. I had worked with his dog years ago. Her name was Bessie and she was a, a bull massive, huge dog. She was 140 pounds. And she was like, I was, I don't want to say I was the only one that could handle her because I had some employees that could handle her too. But she just had this level of like respect and I could get her with the dogs, but I just knew that I couldn't have anybody just handle her and be around the dogs. And so, uh, you know, I had her for like about a year and, um, you know, she was a, a really confident dog, extremely confident and quiet. If she was going to go after a dog, she wouldn't, she, it wasn't like this dog. It was like walk up and raw and then she would just go. Right. So those are a little bit tricky because one, she wasn't sensitive Two. Um, she was quiet. Explain, explain that. Explain I, the, that she wasn't sensitive. Hold on. I got it. Yeah. Dog. So basically it's sensitivity. Like, you know, sound doesn't break the focus that she has any type of touch, any type of like, without having to be like overly forceful, you know what I mean? Like anything that you can bring in, even, even when I apply pressure, like slowing her down, it, it would, it, you know, it, it, she just had a hard time with sensitivity. Right. Yeah. Sometimes like, and, and to, you know, so people understand why I, I, I stopped that because if the dog is, has a really, if you want to call it a, a gnarly side, but they're sensitive, it, it, it kind of balances things out at times because it means they're sensitive to being stopped and worked with and regulated. And so it, it kind of makes the intensity of a bad behavior, not quite as strong because they're sensitive to be able to be worked with. Right. You know what I mean? Is that it's that kind of unknown little variable that, that is, is going to be unique to every owner and their dog. Yeah. I mean, even, even like when I walk into a house and the dog may be a little bit sensitive just for me being there, the newness of me, I use that to my advantage. If you right? need to, absolutely. And, and so this dog was like, from the very get-go, she was like, mm, nah. You know, yeah. She came in really thin. She was, she was huge. This dog was huge. Anyways, long story short, um, you know, after having her for over a year and being uh, unsuccessful, trying to find her a foster home, trying to find someone to adopt her, we had so many people come in that were interested in her, 
uh, and they just never, you know, follow through with the adoption. Um, you know, Ann and I were about to get married, and so we were going to be traveling for the month, and so we just didn't feel comfortable leaving her here with, you know, some of the people that were working for us. And she was just going to be a liability. She was going to, she was going to injure a dog. There was no doubt about it. It was going to happen. Or kill it. I mean, at that size, different. Or it's, it's yes, not hard for her to absolutely. Kill it. And so I remember, uh, you know, having having talking to the, the the group and as a board, they made a decision. You know, we'll just, you know, it's a really tough decision. But we're gonna have to euthanize her because we just can't find a home for her. You know. And so I said, okay, well, I'll go ahead and take her to my vet. And we went to the vet. And I I, I spent the whole time with her, and it was. Uh, it was hard. I got emotional about it. And then uh, I called the rescue after the person I went to talk to. I'm like, hey, I'm just, you know, she put her down. I feel really sorry about this. I, I feel awful that this couldn't work. I felt really guilty about everything. It was probably the first dog that I had to like put down, but I, I took part in the whole thing. I was like, we worked, we went through this together and we're going to go, we're going to go to the end together. And the lady says, I, cause I said, I, I feel like I failed you guys. And she's like, Art, you're, you're the only one that gave her a chance. And that made me really I'm gonna emotional thinking about it, but because like no one gave her a chance. No one gave her the opportunity to, to work with her. I had her for almost a year and a half, I think it was. And so the fact that she said that and she, uh, those words were just probably what I needed to hear at that time because I was feeling really, really guilty about the whole thing. It's, it's tough. Uh, we've all been through that, every one of us. Uh, yeah. If you haven't been through that, you haven't been in it long enough or been fortunate enough that you're just, that nails, right? Or you, maybe you haven't taken on the dogs that have the the risk that bring that decision, yeah. That, that bring that choice, and I, I think there's a lot of variables that come into play. Size comes into play. Yeah, uh, children come into play. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, severity of the way they're biting comes into. There's a lot of things, and and like we were talking about last time or a couple of weeks ago. I mean, dogs create fatalities mm -hmm. you know dogs there are do you remember dude that when it was a mastiff so when people are like well you know what what could happen we had a student come through and are you talking about this yeah on the the opening night we have i wasn't there for that one by the way oh no oh good no. No. Yeah, it was just crazy so we go through and i and i walk around and, and i'll ask questions i'll be like you know what do you hope to get out of the event and this lady looks at me and, and just void of any energy and emotion what was weird and the person next to me we talked about that part which was so so um you could tell like it was it wasn't that it wasn't a serious thing for her but it's just maybe she had just learned to talk about it in this this kind of simple way and she goes i'm here to see, figure out why my dog tried to kill me that was what she said and i went okay you know and, and so she proceeded to tell me um, and I forget when she sh tried to show me the photos. I don't know if it was at the beginning or after the story. So she proceeded to tell me, and I hope I get this right, that she had a unneutered, uh, I think it was a Bordeaux, right? Like, isn't that the Italian Mastiff? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it was a oh, French was, Mastiff. Sorry, French Mastiff. So it was, it was, I think it was, it was. Kind of I think, I think I know so. it was, a, it was, a, it was a Mastiff or a Bordeaux, something to that effect. And it was unneutered and it was humping an unspayed smaller dog of the ladies and she grabbed it to pull it off of that and when she did that it turned around she said it turned around it looked at her and then it bit her and it like bit a, a chunk in her arm and then she she goes and then it proceeded for the next whatever it was 10 or 15 minutes and she goes it trying to kill me and she explained this persistent ongoing attack and she eventually, I guess, got a large piece of tile. She ended up in her garage and there was a large piece of tile and she was able to use the tile to defend herself and then create some separation. And then she tried to show me the photos and I only saw one. Uh, we yeah, that's enough. Or I don't want to, I don't yeah. want that stuff in my head. You're sensitive to that stuff. Small. And if I remember this correctly, it had like 115, 120 staples oh my God. In, in her head. It looked like a bear attack. And she had said that they had to stitch back or, or staple back together. It was like, 15 or 18 places on her body and and she basically just said she didn't die because she didn't die and and she goes she's like i'm here to figure figure out why so the reality is is when you get some of these large dogs that do have 10 and it's the thing is it's it's not the ones that are outwardly aggressive it's where it's easier to actually know what's going to happen with those it's the ones that have that little nuance to it right all of a sudden it comes up oh, wait you stopped me from bucking 
mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I'm feeling a little disrespected, lady. And then it just, it puts the gas pedal down. And that goes back to the sensitivity thing. Mm-hmm. You know, typically speaking, I'm not going to equate a sensitive dog with doing that. Yeah. I'm not saying they can't, but you know, to me, that's, that's a dog that walks around with its head a little high. Its tail goes up real high and stiff. Sometimes it walks into you, you know, they're my guess. And when I talked to her, I said, you know, it sounds to me like respect. And then that can mean a lot of things, but it, if you want to know why, if you're asking me that question, uh, to me, it sounds like the relationship was missing respect and aggression. I remember you posted that story on your social media and I remember Lisa Porter says, I remember that. Mm-hmm. I don't think I was there for that TCW. I, I mean, I, I would have remembered. Yeah. The, the reason it came to me is because I had, I had that big, <laughs> big 150 pound pity. Now what's interesting about that too, so this is sometimes how the energy just, just does not work. Um, I got a message from the owner from that dog after that post. He goes, if you're talking about, uh, what's his name? Kuda, Kuda? I forget what the dog's name was. He goes, dude, he's, he's a great dog. And I'm like, dude, he, uh, there was something about his energy with me. He saw me as, as, as a uh, challenge. Mm-hmm. And I had a trainer. Uh, remember Alessandro? You met Alessandro. I was thinking the same yeah. thing, by the way. And, and he, Alex was great with him. Alex was great with him because Alex has a softer energy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's almost like if you were to measure like our testosterone levels. I, I mean, I know mine's going to be a lot. It, that type of challenge, it felt very primal. He might as well punch me in the dick. Dude, I opened up the kennel one time. He fucking poked me right in the nuts. And then he's kind of like looking at me like, what are you going to do about it? And I stood there and I'm like, I'm not quite sure. You know, because it's like, dude, if I'm, I'm – and I sent a video to Caesar. And this was interesting too. So I, I know my vibe wasn't wrong completely. I sent a video to Caesar. And the video was because this dog had a, a high – floating vagus nerve and if the leash hit pressure a certain way this big mm. ass dog would just flop down like a sack of flour and pass out i remember and that i asked him I'm like dude you ever see something like this and and in the video the video is like six seconds long the the video he's looking the dog looks at the camera and kind of moves towards the camera and, and caesar goes aggressive and i go not yet <laughs> and he starts laughing so <laughs> you know it, it's it's real and you have to know your limitations. And that was also the following week I got attacked. So my mm. energy was, my energy was, was not good. And yeah. to the point of like that dog you had, you take that dog and you try to adopt it for emotional reasons. Yeah. And it, it doesn't work out. It's funny when you send Caesar a video and like, or you watch it with him, like, Hey, check this video. It's like a three minute video. And he gets his phone. He's like, the dog is stuck. That's all he'll say. You know, <laughs> like three seconds in, Oh, the dog is stuck. Yeah. It's hilarious. He did. <laughs> Like, it, thanks. Two so, thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's, it's pain. I and the it, opposite end of that, if you get Lynn, Lynn will break it down. He'll break out a 17 second video for three hours. You know what I mean? That, that helped me so much, man. That, I know. That really, really <clears throat> helped me a ton. Well, you know, he mentioned this. He's probably going to hate it. Well, he mentioned, he didn't go into detail about it that he was, there was a mirror thing that you could do to do some temperament testing. I remember that. Now, to me, it makes like, well, as soon as he said it, I'm like, I can envision what he's looking for, but I'm I don't. talking about Lynn, by the way. Yeah. I, I can envision what you're looking at. Like to me, uh, if you want to go from confident to soft, the confident ones are touching the mirror, going towards it. Then you see the ones that try to play with it. And then you see the ones that try to get away from it. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's what it was, but that's what it, to me would make sense. You know, I believe on, on that same type of note, I think we could actually be doing some virtual socialization work with dogs. I think we could create a room where you basically put like a, like a movie screen and you play social interactions with dogs while your dog is in that room. And I think dogs are visual enough and they could take stuff from it. I think you can, I think you can virtual socialize to a point dogs. If you, if you give the, the right, uh, virtual setup to it. I mean, look, Caesar tried to do it with the trailer and all that other shit with the storm. So it's virtual is, is there's something tangible to it, but I don't think it's been approached right. Hmm. Interesting. Cause when you first said that, I was like, I don't think that would work because, but then you mentioned the, how you can create the sound. But I think in my opinion, I think that the virtual, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just looking differently that, virtually is almost no different than what we see with the other dog that, that from the very the video you know what i mean it's not the same whereas well, but, it, but look how many dogs try to go out of tv right so imagine if that tv is now like you're 
I'm looking here and I'm looking at my entire wall, right? And let's say, you know, you have dogs and all of a sudden two or three dogs go running across. Well, it's, it's an opportunity for you to help that dog not become stimulated by the saying. visual movements and, and the other things. And it also, I, I think, gives some visual learning, right? So you're, you're probably seeing this now with your kids, but like my daughter now is 14. When Jen, my wife, talks, she touches her nose. Who, who knows why? Every, you know, we all have our little quirks. I have my little shit everywhere. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you see my daughter really get into start to talking and, oh uh, yeah, yeah. Right. And so we, we visually model so much of what we see that it's yeah. hard to say like how much we've pulled out, you know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I, I built this, this, um, shed over here and I was going to turn it into a, an office for myself and it's got this big wall. And I was like, dude, this is the room to do it in. I could easily do it. I could make this, I could, I could get the sound piped in. Right. And this big wall right here is just going to be virtual dogs interacting, and, but like doing it in, in the right way, not running around chaotically, but more like mm. pack interactions and mm -hmm. so forth. And I mean, think of how many times we take advantage of one, how many times have you been watched by interacting with one dog and you look over and you see the other four dogs going, well, I know not what to do now. Yeah. You know I mean? Like I know, I'm, all right, don't do that. He just taught us. Or just modeled. Like, you know, when you get those overexcited dogs and my dogs are just hanging out. They almost like, they try to like, come on, let's go. And the dog's like, nah, we're not doing that. And the yeah. dog's like, okay, fine. And then they go and just lay down with them. It's like peer pressure, man. It's the positive side of peer pressure. You know? On so, the same thing with the temperament <clears throat> test. I mean, do you, one of the things I wanted on this is I get asked a lot, you know, do you temperament test? And that, you know, this started with a temperament test. And I don't know if I'm too existential with this whole energy thing, but I think it's relatively difficult to, to really say, oh, this dog's good with dogs. This dog's good with cats. This dog's good with people. This dog's good with this because I, who did the, who did the test? Who did the introduction? Mm -hmm. What energy did we bring around? You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's, um, I don't know. I've helped a lot of rescues and I'm like, okay, this dog needs this energy person. <laughs> this right. dog, you know what I mean? This dog needs, uh, a, a somebody that's more sensitive this dog needs right. somebody who wears cowboy boots type of shit you know you know the difference of what the dogs need but from a temperament side what do you do i mean anytime i go into like and here's the thing like it's hard to recreate every scenario right again what i'm really looking for like when i even go to the shelter and i'm like looking at dogs i look for sensitivity that's all i really look for that's all i really look for is like is does my presence uh, create some sensitivity. You got some, the ones that are like the fly on the wall, you know, kind of on the back. Then you get some of those are a little jumpy, you know? Uh, and then what I do is I use the gate to see if I can move them back a little bit. And so again, that's a little sensitivity. Something's moving towards them and move back. If those ones are just like stuck on the glass, I'm like a little more forward. And so I think it's better to test the temperament with the human that wants it. Like to your point. So if the human that wants the dog walks up to the gate and the dog goes bam, right on the gate, and then another human walks up and the dog stays right here. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. what, which dog are you temperament testing? Because it acted different because of the different energies that came. Yeah. I mean, I, I do it. I wouldn't say I do the same thing every time, but I, at the end of the day, like I'm looking for the energy. Like I've been in, done assessment on some dogs that at the shelter. And sometimes if they're sick, I'm like, well, it's, they're sick. You're not really going to shoot, see the true cell, you know, until you like remove them. And, and sometimes you may, you know, make an assessment on a dog and three months later, they're actually more comfortable. The honeymoon phase is done. Oh, all these for, things. Sure. for sure. I, I learned that the hard way. Um, I remember when I first moved to Florida, I went to the, the biggest rescue I could find and I went to him. I said, give me the worst dog you guys have. Like, I'm like, like, I'm like, good plan, uh, Todd. Yeah, I'm here. What do you got? And well, the good news is they gave me what was a really fearful dog at the time, but I guess he had, he was kind of reactive in ways too. Really fearful. And to your point, real quiet dog for like three weeks. And with, you know, in the work that we we're doing that raises their confidence level. And then one day somebody knocked on the door and that dog's bark, it's like, I, I couldn't believe that bark was in that dog. And it's interesting. You never know, especially if you're actually improving the dog. A lot of, a lot of times people don't realize that if you get a timid dog and you start doing really good work, you sometimes have to reel them back. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can get these guys confident enough that you can get them to move forward and you have to, oh, oh, got to come back this way a little bit. And just because the, the energy of the shelter or the energy of their past was keeping them looking a lot more um, passive than they 
ended up being. It's like, it's almost like a blanket you take off of them, you know? Hey, but by the way, there's another thing that I, you know, when I am making an assessment, like sometimes let's say it's a dog that's reactive to dogs. And, and I was like, you know, let's go, let's go for a walk. Let's go see what the dog does. And I trying to see like what the dog does. And then we don't see any dogs. They're like, man, I'm sorry. I wasted your time. I'm like, no, 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 we can still make this work. Yep. What is your dog like? What makes your dog move forward? Does your dog go crazy for food? Yep. Okay, let's just use food. Does your dog go crazy for a ball? Yep. Well, it's still a forward mind. How can we get the dog to not be so forward with? So we don't have to wait for the explosion. Let's let's start. We were talking about the lion earlier. Yeah. Using it at a lower level mm-hmm. so that you can stop the brain from moving forward. And same thing with, you know, I don't need another dog. I can find anything else that makes that dog move forward. And I find that sensitivity. Right? And for those listening, the, the time to try to stop a dog is not when they're at, at a, a strong point. You're opening up the chance of failure. You're, there's a lot of risk that comes into trying to stop dogs at, at high levels of reactivity or behavior. And what Art's saying is it's so much easier to stop it if you proactively set it up and it's a lower intensity. And if you can't stop the lower intensity, no way it's easy to assume that you're not going to stop the higher intensity. Yep. You know, and so... This temperament testing thing, I went, I had an appointment today, a longtime client. I've essentially, you know, helped her raise these two dogs. They're, they're siblings, but it's one of the sibling cases that I, I think they share a brain. Like they literally like twins, like you'll see, you know, their bodies will all move at the same. And she has a, somebody that brought a couple other dogs and she's like, Hey, are these, can we get them together? And the context is that in the past. The experience with her dogs and these two dogs has been one of them's a pity that gets excited and her male dog and this one kind of tensed and teed off a little bit. Didn't really react, but tensed and teed off. And then this pity also lives with another little like, like a houndy kind of mix. And they were in the fenced area and her dog saw him through the fenced area and just unloaded and lost his shit. Now she does have a couple of experiences where this dog has checked other dogs like it, it will it's a boston terrier so this is what they see so i come in and deal with the excitement sensitive just like you said sensitive pity deal with the excitement you bring the energy level down now what you're really seeing is that no dog has any issues with each other so there's no aggression there's not reactivity there's nothing that these dogs want to hurt each other but that doesn't mean that it's done right so to me now that i can see that we have some compatibility we have to go through what areas can now change the compatibility. Okay, what happens when excitement happens, right? So if, if this mm-hmm. dog and this dog start playing, what's going to change with this dog, right? So that excitement can come from anything. It can come from a squirrel runs along the fence. Yeah. It can come from somebody knocks on the door. It can come mm-hmm. from anything. Then what I want to see is what happens when the dogs start to enter into each other's intimate space in daily living situations and then with resources in those things, right? So there's toys, there's bones, there's humans that are all seen as important. And now we're, we're crossing into intimate space or do the dogs tense up and move out of space? Because now I know that I have these elements where fights can happen. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's now going through the stages of life, which are naturally going to be excited triggers, spatial triggers, and what dogs buy as a view as important. Cause even dogs that can, we can get them to get along. Once you get into living situations, like life situations, it, those moving pieces become difficult for people. By the way, I've mentioned uh, our dog, Gracie. She's a very sensitive dog. She's great with the dogs, really sensitive around humans. And uh, when we first got her, and even to this day, like she she guards the food a little bit, right? So in the beginning, I would feed her crate, feed her in the crate, and the dog would walk by, and she would like show her teeth and <clears throat> like move forward a little bit. And it's not that she's aggressive or anything like that. She just guards her food, right? So I, re- I started feeding her around my other dogs and she, she, you know, she, now she, she's more hesitant. I mean, now she's less hesitant to move towards the food and eat with the other dogs. But as soon as like, let's say my other dog, Honey, is done with her food and Honey just kind of turns it. She does this like, like this posturing. It doesn't bother me. Not that, it, not that I want her to bite my dog, but I know she's so sensitive. I could go like a s- small sound and, and she's like, was that too yeah. much? I'm like, yeah, don't, don't move forward. And then she goes back to eating. And then she started doing it again. And I wait for that moment where she's, she's about to move forward. Psst. Okay, I'll go back to eat. So it's just kind of keeping her balance in the sense of like, don't move forward. Just go back to what you were just doing, you know? So it's that balancing act of like, don't do that. And then eventually she's, I mean, she's come so far, dude. Like she still has her little moments, you know, she did it this morning too. And I caught it. But I'm always like, she's going to get to a point where there's going to be a dog right next to her. And she's going to be fine because I can, I can, I can just start 
slowly just taking it away. You know, just taking layers off. That's all I'm really doing. So that's her sensitivity, but I'm using it to my advantage. Uh, do you prefer sensitive dogs? Do you own dogs? One hundred percent, I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a when you have dogs that aren't sensitive, it's such a long game. Like the thing you just described, a non-sensitive dog is it. You end up with more outcomes that you can you can see are going to happen. You know, you yeah. know that you're, there's going to be more interactions where they do check because you know they're not as as sensitive to that. And the other thing too, along the point of what you just said, is that you. And we've had talks about this. You understand your thresholds. I don't mean boundary thresholds. I mean your energetic thresholds, right. your thresholds of what you can handle in your life and your family before it starts to set your energy into shit. Do you know what I mean? Is I don't think enough people honor how dogs make them feel. We've been conditioned to say dogs always make us feel great. Yeah, I get that. They do. But when dog behavior starts to turn to a certain negative energy, dude, it's, it's toxic. And if you're yeah. living with a dog, you're fearful of becoming aggressive or even some of these super high anxious dogs, which to me, I'd almost rather take a bite than some of that toxic, anxious energy is I don't think people, I don't think they give enough credit to how powerful that energy is. And they, they always choose to see the positive, even when it's, it's like wrecking around them. And I'm always wanting, I'm all for that. But sometimes there's some really bad choices made on that. That they, they don't recognize where their threshold of being able to tolerate all those um, difficult things are, right? If, if every day you think your dog is going to beat the shit out of your other dog or going to bite a family member and you live in a fear of that, you mm. have options. That's what people need mm. to know. Um, you know, like you said earlier, that it wasn't easy to, to let that massive go. But at some point, the threshold just is like it can't continue without it deteriorating something. Mm -hmm. And then you're no good. Then you can't help the other ones that you have. Like it, it, keeping that that energy stable in us is very important. Hey, um, I want to share another story, Todd, um, real quick, if I can. Um, I worked with this client that had, I love this, this client. Like she's a, just a genuine good hearted person. And she had adopted this dog um, that had some resource guarding issues. Um, and I, you know, kind of worked with her and showed her some things. I worked with the dog. The dog was a pretty decent dog, like really good dog, very social, great with humans. But when food was involved, like it was a whole other story and I never saw it. It only happened with the, the owner, the, the mom. And, you know, she would tell me, she would tell me all these things. I'm like, that dog, like never really saw it, that coming. Then she showed me a video. I was like, whoa, did not expect this. And so, uh, long story short, uh, the dog ended up biting her pretty bad, like really bad over, food. over food. But I said, where were you? She's like, I was in the other room. So it ran into the room and bit her. She put the f food down, got him from outside. You know, he walked into the room, came back out and attacked her and cornered her. And she got cornered and got bit really bad. And she was screaming. And I guess a neighbor heard a lot of people walk in her neighborhood. She heard her screaming, called the police. The police ended up coming, confiscating the dog. Um, and, you know, she was heartbroken by it all. And I remember we had a conversation and I was like, look, I won't, sh I won't share her name, but. I just said, look, like, I know this is very traumatic. I'm very sorry that you had to go through all of this. You know, you probably did, you're the last person that deserved to go into this. I was like, look, she's like, well, can I, can I, can I get him? Do you think they'll, the city will let me get him back? I'm like, there's probably a good chance they won't let, they won't release him to you. He's, you got bit pretty bad. And I was like, look, I'm sorry this happened to you, but I said, what if like, you have to think about it? Like you can't be living in a relationship that you feel very uncomfortable where you may be abused again. And so I use that analogy. She's like, yes, but, and she's like, but if this was my son and he had done something and was in jail, I would still love him and go visit him. And I was like, touche. All right. What do you say yeah, to that? No, that's, that's different. That's a mother's argument because that thing came out of her body. Yeah. What if it was your husband? Yeah. Right. Well, the husband, and I was like, look, I was like, what is, I mean, what does your husband want to want to do? She's like, he doesn't want him in the house. I'm like, you have to understand that your husband is protecting you. Yes. I honor him for doing that. He is looking out for your best interest. Do, how I many times you, have you seen this art? It, it creates crazy conflict where this happens and one person's trying to be protective and the other one's coming from heart and the other one's coming from head. And it's just. Yeah. Long story short, she ended up recently adopting a dog and you know, she had lived with this guilt that she wasn't good enough to have a dog. And you know, she kind of just uh, isolated herself and she adopted a dog recently. We're going to be helping her out with her new, her new dog. Her new dog is just, she got, she found from in the streets of Mexico and brought her back. Uh, but it's one of those street dogs, by the way, those village dogs that don't connect. 
Uh, but I'm I'm really up for this challenge because the dog is awesome. Like she she's social, she and she's great with the humans. Uh, she's just all around really good dog. She just gets a little reactive um, on walks, so we're gonna help her out with that. It's the cl- dude. Those are the classic. They say the dog phrase: "Dogs know what you know, know what you don't know." Those street yeah. dogs know. Dude, we don't know shit. <laughs> you know, yeah. they look at you like you don't know. Yeah, I've, I've worked with quite a few because we get they're called. Um, uh, pot cake dogs you know you get them down from the islands and stuff we get quite a few of those up here yeah. i was in asia i got a bunch of the ones off the streets yeah those asian dogs like the shiba inus or the basenjis all those like dude dude i had a puppy here the other day 10 weeks old no nine weeks old nine weeks old i should i should hold up the phone so you can see the video so i use my dogs to assess just like we're talking about uh, assessments right so i use my dogs to assess to back up or support or fill in a gap on you know something i see or don't see so this shiba inu comes up the lady starts talking to me about what it's doing i'm like dude this and its name's i gotta say the name because it's amazing foxy cleopatra best name ever and i'm like damn if this isn't the most dominant little thing i've ever seen so i bring out hercules hercules is dude he holds his own i adopted him from a german shepherd rescue a bunch of years ago you remember him walking out of a house with like 10 german shepherds just he's a chihuahua though right Chihuahua, yeah. yeah. And he, I bring him out, do this dog, doom, stands on its back. <laughs> Just jumps up onto his back, stiff like a doom, doom, like this. Hercules is like, what the fuck? And does it again and he checks him. But it's one of those dogs, just like you said, zero sensitivity, right? Mm-hmm. Comes back and does more. So we go out and we're all big into the set, into like with puppies, like the um, imprinting. State and, and, and stages like follow, play, explore. So those listening may or may not know when you get a puppy, they're like a baby bird, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to, if you set them on the ground, they're going to pretty much follow you around because that's what they're wired for. That's, it's part of the instinct of how they can form these groups and get them to move, yada, yada. And so one of the things I'm always going to do with a puppy is set it down and walk away every time, whenever I'm working with young puppies that age so that we can, I can just show the people this motherfucker was like, nah, I don't need you. He would turn and he would just start going, up, he'd start going this way and start going this way, head up, chest out, like, I'm going to go check this shit out over here. I actually got to the point, I go, you know what? Let's put some pressure on this dog. And we ended up going about 40 yards away, maybe maybe a little bit more. And I could just stand here. I go, we, I go, we got to do something here. And, it, and it, it gave us about 10 minutes of follow after that because the dog went shit. And it, he started to chase up after us. But... This was a dog. Talk about zero sensitivity. I mean, he had no sensitivity and zero connection all, with anybody, with nothing. Yeah. And I have this Frenchie here, and this Frenchie is also very, very, very front and Frenchie front. So it's like a like a bowling ball going for those are the worst ones. <laughs> and, and, and so I brought them together, and the cool thing was is that they actually matched really well. But you could see that the bowling ball style would come in and just go and ram into the dominance of this little puppy and then hold it down for a second. And, and, and then it would let it up and they'd start playing again. And it was, it was two of the least sensitive dogs you could ever conceive of playing. And, and combined, they're not even nine months old. And boy, I told this lady, I'm like, you, oh. Good luck. That's what I say. Good oh, luck. You know, I actually said, look, at this age, I will honestly... I might go back to the breeder and say, here, here you go. Uh, and I even said, look, even if they didn't give you any money back, I, dude, you are in store. Because it already at this age, it was not, it was not mouthing. It's biting. Yeah. It's actually biting to stop any form of direction given to it. It will, it will legitimately bite and, and, go, and go into like a, a legit mode at nine or ten weeks old. Mm. But she did say she – I told her, I go, look, I would give it a day or two, sit down with your family. And, you know, she got it for a 12-year-old son, right? So it's, it's, a, it's definitely not a fit for that age. And I said, yeah. you know, really do some soul searching about this. She texts me the next day. She goes, the dog must have had a scared straight session. It's been with us. It's been calm. It's been relaxed with us today, following us around. So, you know, I don't know if I'm – Incorrect. I don't buy that. I, I just, it's just a little temporary thing. That's what I think. I said, we'll bring the dog back again this week. We'll see if we can do another kind of another run through of things. But dude, uh, puppies are crystal balls. You know, it's not hard to for, to foresee what a puppy is going to become. I, the last puppy I saw that had my attention at this level, it, 
these people called me and they said, we want you here when we get the dog. We're afraid it's going to be, a, we, we're afraid of having an aggressive dog. And it was an Akita. Oh God. And dude, the thing came rolling in like, you know what I mean? It, like Jimi Hendrix thing just fucking came in or leather jackets, fucking cruising. And, and I said, all right, here's, and I spent some time with him. So here's my suggestion. I said, you told me you don't want a dog that's going to be difficult to have mm -hmm. and control. I go, that's what you told me. That's why I'm here to help you with this. I go, this is not that dog. I go, the, to me, if this was, you know, the two best choices, I go, give it to me. I, I, cause I was, I wanted that energy at that time. And I said, give it to me. Or I would call the breeder and see if they have another puppy that you can. And didn't. And we worked. 11 months old, grabs a neighbor's dog by the head and body slams it, bam, <laughs> just for getting a little too excited. And then by, I think, two years old, it attacked a family member and put him in the mm. hospital. And then they let it go. Then they had to do what you were talking about with the, the dog before. That's interesting, too, by the way, like how we can see even as a puppy, yep. like how the dog will be. I've told people, like, when they get a dog, I was like, you do realize you got a really confident dog. What do you see, Art? What is it that you see that helps you understand? those things you mentioned forward brain and stuff like that and timidness and sensitivity can you explain um how you see it so there's uh uh i usually use my own dogs to tell me right uh when i brought in no doing it on your own what's that is it because you suck at doing it on your own no i can do it on my own i can see it a lot of times i don't have my dogs here Just but kidding. my dogs will tell me a lot when i brought in nogi when i found her on the street i could already tell she's already really sensitive the first thing that i noticed is when I, I put her, I got her on leash and I started moving with her. She was kind of like timid. Yeah, she was on her back when I found her. She was like, I thought she was injured. Uh, put a leash on her and or oh, put a foot like, lead on her. She's that sensitive. Yeah. But then like, as I'm walking her, a leaf rolls by and she tries to chase it. And I was like, oh, this is a little, little, you know, that tells me something right there. That little thing that she chased a leaf means -ish, it, like uh, enough self-assuredness to move forward, but sensitive enough to really easily deal. With. Yeah. And so I brought her over here. And as soon as like, I told my wife, hey, I got a dog. I'm going to bring it home, whatever. So she meets me outside because Anne had also found two other dogs in our neighborhood that were strays. And so River brings out a, a water bowl and sets it down. And immediately she puts her head down and starts like doing her tail like this. Submissive like, to the youngest member of your yes. family. Yep. Well, the, he's the oldest of our oh, two excuse boys. Me. That's right. You're the, you're the but uh, that, uh, that right there was a really good sign for me. Sensitive dog to the kids, right? Not jumping, not, you know, very sensitive to that. She puts the food down. And then I said, all right, bring Nala. Nala's our most, like, I call her the most pure dog we have. Like, she was never, she was in a hoarding situation, so she was raised by dogs, so she knows just how to be a dog. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we brought her out, and immediately this dog just kind of, like, puts her head down, you know? Then I was like, okay, we got a sensitive dog. We're good. So then I was like, all right, let me bring out the other dogs. And so I take her to the backyard, and I start bringing can one. They be, are, are, can they be too sensitive? What would, what, what would too sensitive look like? Yeah, the, the too sensitive are, like, they start showing teeth. Mm -hmm. They want space. If I see that, I'm like, okay, I'll give you some space. Yeah, you can have the space. I'm not going to overdo it. So all the same cues that you're actually saying, they can be respectful. They can dip their head. They can they can yep. show all these respectful cues. But you can tell they get to a point where they socially too, too much the too much pressure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you put too much pressure, then they can react, and then the dogs can react back. Even though my dogs wouldn't do that. So I brought around the other dogs, and I was just like, this dog has like a nice, good sensitivity about her. Uh, then I brought her back there, and you know, I had her off leash, and then she started to get a little more confident around the dogs, and she started like, rawr, rawr, rawr. and then Nala addressed it right away. I actually have it on video. I put it on my social media one time, uh, and it's just not uh, like kind of addressed. It. Nala does this thing where she does a like a chest bump, and she like yeah. rolls the dog. And the dog's like, okay, like, uh, I won't have to. She doesn't bite them. She just kind of rolls them. Yeah. And then ever since day, is that day, and I was like, I mean, Nogi's like, all right, Nala, I got it, you know? So I knew that she was like forward enough, confident enough, but also sensitive enough to like in certain situations. So like if she's getting too worked up, I'm like, hey, knock it off. And she's like, okay, I'll stop right here. And it's interesting because you and I would have different, like what we're looking at as a sensitive reaction would be different because we have different energies. You know, like you have a, a, I think a softer, smoother energy than I do. So you can get away with having a little bit more of a sensitive dog than I can. Like I, I want sensitivity to it, but I think you can get away easier. I think a sensitive dog is going to feel better. Like when you get into some of those really sensitive ones with you, yeah. my energy is not as like smooth and, and, and that level is yours. And so I think it's important for people to know that it's not about the dog sensitivity. It's about a lot of it's their sensitivity to you, your environment, your dogs, the life that you have for them as well. 
you're a loud Italian family, dude. You can't have like a sensitive dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? They'll get poor, they, poor they'll, Steve and his dogs. Yeah, totally right. You know, it's like, and that kid. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's uh, being able to to see a dog's temperament is so much different than being able to temperament test. And I, I don't think there's really anything to test for, but understanding what your temperament's like, understanding what what you're looking at the temperament's like is how we create compatibility. I mean, most of our job is cleaning up incompatible situations. Um, if it's compatible, it's a little bit of knowledge, right? A, a situation where you walk in, you're like, oh my God, you and your dog are perfect for each other. That's because just like you said, you're seeing that sensitivity, it's balancing out. And then it's just a knowledge or technical conversation. Other, other than that, the trying to get a dog to be more sensitive to you or you get control of a dog that's really strong is difficult if it's not natural. If it is, if it's not naturally coming off of you, teaching you to be stronger or weaker is hard. Yeah. One more story real quick that I just remembered. Yeah. Um, it was a dog that I worked with. Uh, they were telling me that this dog had bitten the owner um, because of a peanut shell. And I was like, okay, that was weird. It was specifically a peanut shell but also had bitten the girlfriend. The girlfriend was a, a model. She was like a, I don't know, some sort of model. And the dog bit the girl in the face. Had oh, like stitches. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was like, bring, bring, bring her over here. And so I brought her over. She was also like with resource guard food. And so what I did is I back tied her and I just wanted to see like what she would do. So I kind of brought the food where she could move forward. I mean, and just, you know, see her curiosity and things like that. But also if I can just make her move back slightly with you know, a sound or my presence, like just something. And she was responded pretty well to it. And so I, you know, I kind of worked with her and I started feeding her and doing things like that, and she, you know, elevating the food bowl and just trying to change things. And so owner comes at the end of the day, it's, you know, come back and I kind of show her like, look, these are the things. But as soon as the owner got there, she got really tense, like, like did this. And I was like, Hey, like, and I'm holding the food bowl. And I was like, look, I, we, I want you to see how we're going to move this dog back slightly. Right. And so I made a sound and the dog just got like, and then lunged at my face. Luckily it was back tied. I remember you telling me about this. It got me on, she on my hit you because you showed up at a TCW and you had a, you had a mark a scar. Yeah. Right, yeah. right here. And yeah. so she went like this. I turned my head and she got my cheek, right? Your yeah. cheek is, she didn't like, I mean, it, it was enough to like leave me a little cut. and. I didn't realize that she had punctured me. And I said, the owner's behind me, standing behind me, right? And I said, hey, just wait it out. I need for this dog to calm down before I move away. Just let it, let it calm down. So I waited, waited, waited. <laughs> the dog calms down, lays down. And I turn around and the, the owner goes, oh my God, because it's, you know, I had this little cut and I just, all this blood on my face. So it's one little tiny cut and all this blood. I didn't know. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, what happened? He's like, you have all this blood on your face. He's freaking out, right? I was like, How long did it take for the dog to calm down? Uh, 15 minutes or it took a while that was really worked up so then um went inside got cleaned up and i was like all right let's have a talk we need to have a talk <laughs> can we talk um and so i started asking more questions like i mean i had already asked some questions but i was like what's what's his dog's like what what else is a resource guard he's like one day it's a leaf one day it could be a page yeah. so all these things and i'm like look here's the problem can we work with the food yeah we can but then what else is it going to be a piece of cardboard on the floor that's going to decide to resource guard. I go, it's making a decision. How do I proof the entire world? You can't. It's impossible. And I was like, look, you know, you have to play it safe. Like, we want to play it safe. You need to make a decision what we're going to do with this dog. Anyways, long story short, um, months go by and it ended up attacking him pretty bad, like really bad. And he's so, an artist too. When you said it had that conversation, you were essentially saying, hey, dude, you have a couple of choices. You better think clearly make a choice, maybe let it go. You can keep it, but there's a risk, right? I, we don't make choices for people. We just put it on the table. I mean, you saw right. that coming. You knew yeah. that was going to happen. And I, I told him, I was like, look, it's, it's going to happen again. Like, it's going to happen again. Um, and it gets worse because the yeah. dog's like, look, bitch, <laughs> what does it take? You know, if your dog is acting possessive and, and you go back in for a second or third trip in, sometimes they're going to strike quicker and harder. Yeah. <laughs> Man, this is a, a sharing stories that have like some of these. These are the most memorable ones, by the way. I remember these specifically. It's the ones that, uh, that not, 
that gave you the most trouble you always remember. But I learned. Well, there's what I think at the beginning, what happens is you, you set out and you don't want to think none of them cannot be helped. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and a lot of ways there is a, it is true. Like in, in our environment, if left to our devices and our ability to manage and work and train and fulfill the majority of dogs, we could, we could live a good life with. Yeah. Now we'd get along better with some than others. Some would be easier than others, but I think we would have the skill set to, to pull off most of them. So I think at the beginning, and I just had a student here over the weekend. And one of the lessons that I, I help, especially with some of the younger trainers, you know, she's been doing it a while. I can tell she's good, but there's an idealistic approach as opposed to a realistic approach. And an idealistic approach is like, well, these are everything that can be done. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. do you have kids? Okay. You don't have kids. So then you don't know what that, you don't know what that realistic part is like. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Do you have um, um, your kids' friends come over mm -hmm. to your house that are six? Right. Do you, that, so it's, it's realistic versus this idealistic thing. And a lot of trainers paint a picture that no, it can all be fixed. And again, it's not that it's wrong, but like this guy, you just said, you know, Hey, yeah, in a perfect situation, maybe it's going to be okay. But what if he's going to pick this up and you're going to go over there and you're going to get tattooed for it? Um, I, th I think that's the part that's hard is, be, is staying realistic, but also staying extremely positive that everything can be changed. Yeah. I noticed a lot of those dogs um, that are bottle fed have a lot of those behaviors in the sense of like, they're not normal. They weren't raised by a dog, you know, they're raised by a human, two different species that wasn't able to, you know, connect. And the, I mean, even with kids, human kids, if they don't grow up, in a good natural environment, you see a lot of the traumatic things later on in life, you know? Uh, if you study, dogs. There's a real interesting um, psychological studies based on uh, like Romania, Eastern European orphanages back in the communist era, right? So a lot of the countries that are not communist now, but countries were communist and they had um, homes with, with children, full of children, like orphanages. And from what I understand, like kids will actually create a mother. They'll create their own connection. And if, if we had a student, remember, we had a student that ended up being a volunteer for a while, Vladimir, 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 he came from one of those. And what happens is in the absence of contact from a mother, neurological connections and all these different connections don't happen in the brain. And so like your essence as a human doesn't get connected. Just like you're saying about a dog, if you're raised and you're bottle fed and you're not around the puppy pile up and getting corrected by your mom and, and having the warmth of your mom that you're, you're your brain doesn't wire itself properly and, and therefore you're going to end up all kinds of developmental issues. And if you study it, it's, it's fucking interesting to see in the absence of a maternal figure in contact, what kids do and what they become. It is unavoidable what they become. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a tangible set of, of characteristics and it's, it's based on that. And that's why, you know, we have these things, what are they called? Singleton puppies or whatever that, you know, it, it's the same. We, we fuck up development no matter what you do, if you don't mm -hmm. let it happen naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, man. Final thoughts. Well, I, you know, my, my whole thing has been, and as I've gone through more of the social media is I really want people to understand their dogs. I want to, I want people to be able to look at their dog and, and know how it feels, not guess, not be overly emotional one way or another, but really learn how to communicate better. Right. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm hoping out of all of this is that people aren't going What's the technique I need? Right. It's the ability to look at the situation and break it down and, and understand the nuance of assessing a dog, how it feels about this dog and how it, it kind of feels the same, but different about this dog. And I want people to go online and instead of looking for techniques and for tools, I want you to learn about reading situations and assessing situations and turning down volume and watch a, a dog whisper episode without the volume and see yep. if you can figure out what's going on and, and learn how to get more intact with that side of yourself. So that's my final thought. Yeah. My final thought is that there's in the natural world and the natural, how dogs perceive things that using these stuffed animals or anything that's unnatural. I mean, yes, you can use it to help you out, but I don't think it's the final say to, to show that a dog is truly aggressive. Um, no, never. So that's how we started it with the video. Um, if you guys would like the video with sound, I would be happy to upload it to our YouTube and you guys can watch it there and just remind me. 
Uh, but why, by the way, we had some really good comments um, on the YouTube. So guys, keep them coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I think we should go and maybe answer. There was one that I specifically want, wanted to answer, but we can't do it now. But we'll definitely. Uh, we're not brothers. Art and I are not brothers. No. <laughs> definitely not brothers. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I will see you. I mean, I, I'll see you next week also. And oh, I'll I'm... see you in a couple of weeks. Hey, by the way, well, yeah. I'll talk to you after. I have an idea for when we're in California. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Docs Ecology Podcast with Todd and Art. See you next week. Thanks, guys.